I'm Fuchsia Hart, I'm the Iran Heritage Foundation curator for the Iranian collections at the V&A, the Victorian Albert Museum, so just around the corner. Um, and while my role at the museum focuses uh, largely on our collections from Iran, I also have the pleasure of having the responsibility for um, all textiles from the Middle East. So it's with that hat on that I'm here today. I'm delighted to welcome Um Saeed, who is an Asadu master weaver. Um Saeed lives in Maithir in Qatar, and she started weaving when she was 13 years old. So delighted to introduce Dr. Karim Canavan. She's principal lecturer and researcher at Cardiff Metropolitan University here in the UK um, in the Cardiff School of Art and Design. She was subject head of textiles from 2004 to 2020 and research fellow to the Asadu Weaving Society in Kuwait. And she's currently responsible for the Cardiff School of Art and Design research-led sustainability in the curriculum. And finally, we're also thrilled to be joined by Farah Al Yassin, who's the head of the creative residency uh, by Caravan Us, currently located in Qatar. Uh, Farah is working closely with the Asadu women weavers community in Qatar, providing engagement and support uh, and involving them in multiple projects, both locally and internationally. And I also want to say thank you to Wafa, who's here today to interpret for Um Saeed as well. What we really want to start with is to kind of start at the beginning and think about the history of, uh, of Asadu, because it's a textile tradition with a really long um, and vivid history. And once it emerged in the Gulf region, it's been practiced by nomadic peoples um, of the desert uh, for, for a long time, but it's also had very specific functions historically. So, Kirin, I really want to start with you, um, sort of from your research. Can you tell us a bit more about the origins and early history of the tradition? Sadu, Al Sadu is um, considered uh, to be one of the oldest and most ancient weaving techniques uh, and cultural techniques in the um, in the Middle East. Um, Al Sadu is is vital and critical as a material culture. Um, it expresses um, the women's voice and their ability to to express themselves and their nomadic lifestyle through their patterns and their symbols and their motifs. And they express themselves through the patterns and symbols of the environment that was around them. So the desert, the huge horizons and skies of the desert. The textiles were all <coughs> hand spun with a very high level of skill to produce hand-spun yarn. So all the textiles were hand-spun with fibers from their animals their possession, that they possessed uh, during their, um, their, their nomadic lifestyle. And they would then weave them, as you've explained a little bit, Fuchsia, the, uh, on the ground loom. Now, a ground loom is a very simple loom, very ancient loom, and it really hasn't changed very much at all. It's a structure with a, a back beam and a, and a breast beam secured and anchored into the sand traditionally in the four corners of it to create the tension required for the warp threads uh, to be woven. Like, like the Al Sadu, which is also the name of the loom as well as the textile, the loom is able to be um, rolled up and moved um, easily as, as the tribe would move. Likewise, all the component parts of the tent. The narrow strips uh, were woven by the women weavers and um, stitched together to make much larger elements, which were all rolled or, or moved as, as they had to move. So some of these, Beit al Shah was woven in goat hair. It had particular properties, um, so which is why the goat hair, the dark colored hair, was generally used uh, for the narrow sections that were stitched together for the, for the tent parts. But then when you come within the interior um, elements, then they would use fibers from the, the sheep and um, perhaps on occasions, camel hair as well. Everything had a utilitarian purpose uh, to it. Everything was practical, everything was used and useful and not, not really um, um, used otherwise. But there was an appreciation of aesthetics. The women, through the textiles, through the pattern sections, was the area that they could express themselves. And they expressed themselves through the patterns and symbols of the environment that was around them. 
the women would, would tease and, and card the fibres before spinning using a hand drop spindle, which is a very ancient tool and really is still used today and hasn't changed at all. The men would shear the, the, the sheep and the women, um, and from a very young age, uh, the young girls would be taught the process of spinning. In fact, Klaus um, Ferdinand, in his book Bedouin of Qatar, mentions... Um, that women go, rarely are seen uh, without a drop spindle or either under their arm. Um, every process when they even migrating across the desert would be spinning. Um Said lives in Maithir in Qatar, um, and she was taught by the women in her family um, who'd inherited the skill of weaving from, from their family. She's really proud of the work that she's done through the years um, and the, the role that her efforts have played in the revitalization of uh, the, tra the tradition of Asadu weaving in the country. She's still very much an active weaver um, and she's really motivated by the encouragement that she sees within the community around her. She's currently teaching and transmitting all these skills, knowledge, uh, and the wisdom of Asadu weaving at the Hinat Salma farm uh, as part of the Caravan Earth Creative Residency. One of the biggest, um, most important values that we have with our work, with our foundation, um, is and the residency program is to not only revitalize the, the traditional knowledge and skill and technology and, and, and wisdom to you know, be passed on to a next generation, but also to appeal to a, to a larger audience. Once we have began the work with making sure that we have the supply chain and everything is, is sort of in order um, to create a production, the only way you can really revitalize the craft is by creating market demand. Mm -hmm. And obviously doing it with the right values and principles that we obviously um, are within our ecological values, with our social cultural values. We have 50 weavers I would love to be able to have all of them be weaving as we speak right now. But um, through the cycle of obviously working closely with, with the weavers, you also kind of have to ex understand the, the function of the textile. So when we come to place, we've, we've you know, put, into, um, we've put the idea into turning it into interiors, mm -hmm. into perhaps um, wearables mm -hmm. and um, you know, beautiful um, functional pieces that we use day to day. And it has to appeal to perhaps a younger audience or a different audience that they wouldn't normally see this sadu textile as something that is, you know, linked to the past. We're very um, keen on continuing this tradition in a way where it has market demand mm -hmm. and appeal to the public, but also with that being said, uh, to have it being taught. Mm -hmm. So through our work and, and being able to commission um, our weavers, We've had interest from their daughters um, to actually pick up the spindle. There's this beautiful um, sense of humor between weavers. So they all are one community. And within the, um, uh, the, the, the tribes, you can distinguish the different motifs. There's this really friendly banter between them, almost competition on who has the most difficult technique and, for example, the interpretation of the tree, the shtero. Um, so she was just saying that you know, if I see another weaver doing a, a, a motif that I have not thought about or hasn't occurred to me, then I have to, you know, step up and, and make something better. There are different sections to the weaving and there are different types of weaving. Mm. Um, so the simplest of the uh, weaving, which was, for example, the roof of, of the, the, the tent al-shah, um, the bait al-shah, the, um, there's a simple warp uh, 
uh, warp-faced rep weave, which is a very simple, that's the simplest of the techniques. And then beyond that, there are a, another three techniques which are much more complex, two of which have a, a complementary warp structure, which means that then the preparation at the warp stage, the women um, weavers have the opportunity to pick the colours out or create the patterns that we see around us. And that's through a complementary. So when you're threading up the warp threads where there are patterns, <clears throat> there's a choice of colours beyond the, the base colour. The second type of weaving, which I, has this picking uh, method, is called a midka which has a very geometric, repeating, long repeating it ten, uh, pattern technique, which often represented the, the desert and, and the, the pace of the camel, the rippling sand dunes. There's a lot of repetition and cyclical um, living uh, as, uh, uh, in the nomadic cycle. And, and so rhythm and including men's poetry, which were reflected by the men where the women could reflect some of this through their geometric repeating patterns. And the, tr the triangle shape, the repeating triangle that you'll see a lot in our sadhu textiles is called a wearjan. But it's really important that you get the information and the name of the symbols from the weaver herself, preferably at the time of weaving if possible, but not obviously with some of the historical textiles. But the name of the pattern is specific to the weaver herself. The next and the most complex um, patterning technique is in the shajara, the tree. It was very often the central pattern of the most important uh, textiles, particularly the tent divider that I mentioned earlier, the gata. That would have sections of the tree um, panel running through it, and that gave the most information and enabled the weaver herself to express herself most in that se section. The weavers that, uh, that could... Uh, weave this technique were, sh were called Dafra or Victorious. It was most prestigious. It really was most extremely hard. You have to count a lot. You have to pick the select the, the patterns to create the symbols. Um, and then their representation of, of what they, those, were, those motifs were representing was entirely um, at the discretion of the weaver herself and how she was feeling that day, how she was weaving on that occasion. The zoragum, which is a weft facing, so the weft is the shorter thread going across the warp threads, and that's a twined um, binding technique called ragum, which was very bold and often uh, diamond or triangular in shape, the patterns that they created. And again, on this wonderful, magnificent textile, the gutter, the tent dividing curtain, on the edge of that, there was very often the ragum would be combined with the midka and the shajara and the plain warp weaving. And um, the ragum was like a badge or a welcome into the into the Beit El Shah. And do the colours have meanings as well? في في المعنى لهالألوان إنه إذا استعملت مثلاً البني الفاتح مختلف عن البني الغامق مختلف عن الأبيض أو البيج. إحنا نعرف السدو إن الألوان المعتمدة الأبيض والأسود والبني والعنابي. والبرتقالي هذه الوان السدو والمعتمدة لكن عقوب الناس كل ذوقه يعني بعضهم يأخذ الألوان الاصطناعية يشكل فيه هذا شيء ثاني. The five main colors are the that pale brown, dark brown, beige, uh, the Bordeaux عنابي and then the black and the orange. Which is from the saffron. Now, the if white. you want to add colors, uh, uh, use artificial colors. It's up to you. But the five standard colors of the sadhu, they start from zero, from scratch. So they take the wool. The wool is made by the sheep that live on the farm. Then they card it, and then they spin it, and then they put it on the loom, and then they weave it. So it's a circular economy.
but it's interesting that the different colours have uh, are said to have different meanings, such as um, natural dyeing has long died out, had long died out the knowledge of natural dyes with the inclusion of, of chemical dyes, which were very easily and cheap and readily available from India and other places. And uh, yes, they used um, dyes from their environment, from um, traditionally from the desert flora and fauna, but also toadstools like Urjun were created the most beautiful colours. It was told to me that the um, by the master weavers that red represented the difficulty and the blood of the desert and the harsh living conditions of a nomad. Um, and whereas orange, everything when you're in the desert is reflects the sun and the, the orange really represents the sun and the environment and, and so on. And then accent colors of blue and green would be chemical dyes to add um, pops of color here and there at, as, at, their, at their will, at their choice. in the National Museum in Kuwait and at Sadhu House in Kuwait, as well as other museums in, in the Gulf region. Um, the textiles are um, accessible and they're moved, and they're, but, the, but the collections have a life. They come out, they're seen by the people I've, um, and, and on occasions used um, for important guests and so forth. Um, the permanent collections I'm talking about even. Um, so they're on display. Whereas when I've worked in museums in Edinburgh that has um, a small but very fine Al Sadu collection in Edinburgh, um, um, they're boxed away. I would opening boxes that apart from being checked hadn't been open or seen by people or displayed or exhibited for decades. Mm -hmm. So on the one case, they were beautifully preserved and curated and documented um, and not used or had no life. And on the other hand, they were being used. We did um, a project where I took a lot of old textiles and information back to university students and we combined some of the culture in, 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 in the, the UK, in the UK and in the Gulf. They combined lots of the, the, the cultural and material cultural um, patterns associated with Al Sadu, but in a very modern interpretation and created digital designs which were then um, hand spun, uh, hand woven in beautiful silks to create an interpretation of Al Sadu mm -hmm. but for fine interior quality um, um, products and, and indeed went on into to stationery and paper, handmade paper qualities with again using the symbols and the patterns and the in, uh, influences of Al Sadu. It's not Al Sadu, but it's 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 an, an interpretation it's an of it. it. Tradition mm. is a continuous, um, mm. you know, engine that keeps going and going, and and it's our duty to make sure that the way we continue or pass on, you know, the baton is is in the right. Um, you know, with the right framework. Mm -hmm. So um, with, with the residency, not only there is a vocational program that we hope to also continue growing, we make sure that everything that we produce has functional mm -hmm. element to it. It's utilitarian. Mm -hmm. We don't produce them for the sake of, of just, mm -hmm. you know, hanging them in a, in a museum or in a gallery, mm -hmm. but actually they have daily use and relevance. How, what is the most important thing we can do to protect and continue and revitalize traditions um, like Asadu. What, what instruments sort of do we have to, um, to help protect this, this tradition? You need to have a school. Mm -hmm. You need to have teachers who have learned the Sadu technique. Oh, Yes, yeah. you need to teach people so it will not die. It's really that transmission, yeah. having and the structure to teach it. Yeah. Structure yeah. and teaching, yeah. Because the Sadu has a lot of things. It has a lot of things and the So it you need a number of people because she sees it as uh, would will develop. So some people would probably work on the motifs, some people would work maybe on the uh, coloring, some people would work on another aspect of it. But that's why you need the quantity of people. 
um, it's a challenge to also get people to come and, and to really be completely devoted to the actual uh, weaving. But it's the most essential part to have this apprentice um, uh, apprenticeship between the weavers yeah, and the teaching, teaching so yeah. that not only that the skill is being transferred, but also the wisdom. And so uh, when we began our research and, and, and you know, reaching out to, to Dr. Canavan, and obviously making sure that we're documenting everything, we realized that Qatari Sadu was not registered uh, amongst the many countries in the region uh, and the Gulfs. And so that's where the work began. We reached out to our, our Ministry of, of Culture and the UNESCO, and we actually successfully um, recognized Sadu in Qatar uh, because, um, again, it's not, a, it's not a dead craft. Yes, we have Sadu in museums. However, the women that I, um, I have the honor of working with are a true testament that it's not dead. And so the motifs that you see in, in, in Qatari Sadu from the, the rest of the Gulf areas are different and are particular because they do come from different tribes. We don't do the work for it to just be recognized by, you know, UNESCO. We do it because it, it is, um, first of all, a way for us to um, revitalize this traditional knowledge for ourselves, first things first, and also to empower our communities. However, um, it does give us a lot of pride to know that, or to at least share, that it's not a dead craft. So for us, contributing or perhaps, you know, submitting the file is to just say, well, it's not dead. The people are very much still alive and those bearers are of knowledge and skill are still very much active. And it's not just, you know, documented and put on the shelf.